Welcome to the show, Bill. How's it going? Uh, it's going great, Andy. Thank you for having me. Oh, this is great. I'm, I'm excited to have this conversation with you today. Uh, you and I are, are are both family men, and we have the, a desire to yeah. uh, help our families, uh, I guess, do the best that, they, that we can for them. And I'm really excited to have some conversations with you about helping to help our children get that uh, wealth mindset, just like uh, we're trying to as well. So, uh, yeah. I, you know, you and I are both family men. Could you tell us a little bit about your family and uh, where you're from and, and maybe the ages of your kids? Yeah, uh, I'm from, uh, hail from Palo Alto, California, grew up here in Silicon Valley, uh, as did my father, as did his father. So one of the few uh, uh, local natives for multi-generations, back when it was apricot orchards. <laughs> uh, so anyway, um, my wife and I met at uh, Princeton on the other side of the country and um, got married when we were 21. And since then, we've had five kids, and um, and we just had our first grandchild. Oh, that's incredible. Congratulations. So, uh, that is why the site is called My Family is a Zoo, Fam Zoo. <laughs> I love it. Well, let's talk about that. So you're the CEO of a company called Fam Zoo. Why, why did you decide to start this company? Yeah, I created the uh, original concept because I wanted to teach my kids uh, the basics of personal finance. Uh, as many folks have probably heard, Palo Alto is a bit of a bubble. Uh, it's not terribly normal. And I would like to have my, um, you know, my kids have uh, experience managing a finite resource of money and um, not be skewed by the bubble that we live in. So around middle school for the older kids, uh, um, the older kids are 27 and 25 now. Um you know, I we they hit middle school, and my wife and I realized, hey, someone's got to teach these kids about money, <laughs> and they, you know, managing money, and they weren't certainly weren't learning that in school, and there weren't any products out there. So, um, you know, we started with a cha spare change in the sock drawer and stuff like that, but when you got family of five kids, there's a fair amount of theft that goes on. So <laughs> it was yeah, it was time to understand, hey, what's this thing you know called the bank? So I'll I'll keep the the coins and and um, and the dollars and how about you know you learn what an account is which originally was just an entry in a spreadsheet and um, being a lifelong computer nerd I finally got tired of them coming into my office saying hey what's my balance on the spreadsheet so I built them a little website that they could sign in to and uh, so that was the very first iteration of famzoo.com so it came out of your personal need then yeah, it did. Uh, and um, and then I realized, hey, you know, kids can learn more than just what an account is. They could learn some things like interest, you know, what interest is. And that's a little tougher to do. I know you use the, the three jar method, which is a great place to start. But one of the neat things about kind of going electronic is you can start introducing a lot of concepts that um, – that you know we we find in the real world. Well, I guess you could argue interest doesn't exist in the real world, but uh, <laughs> with bank interest near zero. But right. you know that's the neat thing. If you're running the bank, you get to to decide what interest is interesting. And um, you know what I like to do is give my kids like a weekly interest at a pretty healthy interest rate, so that every week they are like, oh, if I move my money over to the savings component, you know my money will work for me. That's and uh, it'll grow, right? Yeah, that's incredible. I like I like how it's it's gotten. You know, you you mentioned the jars. I've I've got the jars for Zoe, my my almost six year old, and I, I, the, what what you've talked about with Famzu and all the ability for the kids to learn, as well as it sort of almost puts the jars on steroids a little bit and gives it gives it an enhancement of what you need. Uh, I'm really excited about yeah. learning more about that. Absolutely. Cool. Yeah, basically, what we're trying to do mm -hmm. is. Is model a lot of the general concepts that you'll f that we as adults find in the real world, but mm -hmm. but uh, simplify them, speed them up in time because kids you know operate on a faster clock, mm -hmm. and allow parents to tune the amounts to an amount that makes sense for a kid. So a kid's not going to be overly thrilled with uh, you know you take grandma's check and put it in a, a traditional bank, and then a year later you say, look, you earned a penny. <laughs> Uh, so what does that tell your kid? Well, uh, my folks stole money from me and gave me a penny in return. I mean, that sucks. So if instead they're getting a text message every week that says, oh, the, the money on my savings card earned 20 cents from the bank of dad, then they start asking really interesting questions in a fairly short amount of time. Like, 
uh, Dad, could you move 10 bucks from my spending card to my savings card? Because I'd like to earn more of that interest. Oh, that's and, great. you know, so, uh, so I do pay them, uh, you know, like I was just bringing up my sons. I pay them 0.16% every week, compounded every week. Mm-hmm. And that kind of works out to uh, looks like 8.34% compounded annually. And the way I figure it is, that's pretty legit. Like if you invested long term in the stock market, you know, you get something around that. Um, and uh, we're trying to teach kids, you know, long term habits. But um, I figure if they get hooked on savings now, it might just stick That's later. Great. That's great. And, and have you found that with your 27 and 25 year old? Yes, actually, I do get texts from them, and I've written several posts on the te- text that I get asking to shift money to the savings bucket. Oh, and uh, the only disappointing thing about it for them is at some point the bank of dad interest goes away. <laughs> I was going to say, what is that, on the 30th birthday? <laughs> <laughs> right, we're still we're still figuring that out. No, actually, my daughter, is 27, is, uh, is, has been weaned off of the parent fate interest oh. and is doing just- She's 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 okay. Okay. Well, cool. Well, let's help people understand this mindset too, because I love what you're doing for your kids, and I think a lot of people struggle with that. You know, whatever phase they are uh, in and in life, you know, they're they're trying to give their kids. You know, you've probably heard this, Bill, the best life possible, and sometimes that gets a little confused with giving them everything that they want. Uh, and, and, and right. I, I guess, you know, I guess my, my question to you is how can people avoid this trap of trying to, you know, uh, give their kids the best lives possible through, through wants or, or objects? I mean, what, what can we do to avoid that for people? Well, I mean, that brings so many things to mind just because my definition of the best life possible, I mean, that's really what it gets down to. Um, I have a couple of favorite quotes for you that I'll share that Absolutely. are on this topic. Uh, <laughs> one is from classic Dear Abby which is if you want your children to turn out well, spend twice as much time with them and half as much money. Mm. It's one of my favorites, like right? Because that. yeah. that's what kids really crave. Um, another unknown uh, attributed quote is the best thing to spend on your children is time. And then another one from uh, Holly Johnson at, at Club Thrifty that, that went by my tweet stream one day was, kids don't need stuff, they need us. That's great. And I think that's just so important for us to remember. And... It had a lot to do, um, you know, I had a different situation where I was living in this bubble where, you know, kids are jetting off to a a, a birthday party or, you know, when Teslas come out, there's no, I think there's probably more Teslas per capita in Palo Alto than any other place, right? (laughs) And I was always the you know, the executive who drove, drove the old Mazda protege. So I was kind of a, at one point my boss came to me uh, at Oracle Corporation where I was an executive and said, Bill, don't I pay you enough? <laughs> 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 and I said, why no? So have you don't? No, I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> why do you want to pay more? <laughs> but, you know, to me, that those things just don't feel important. And I think that um, what's interesting is if you communicate to that, that to your kids, it almost becomes a source of pride to them that those things aren't important to them either. Mm. Um, now, there's nothing wrong with with spending money on things that you love. Mm. So if you're really a car enthusiast, I just don't happen to be a car enthusiast. And so what I was able to tell my kids is like, that's just not something that's on my agenda. It's not critical for me. It doesn't give me pleasure. Um, so I just don't spend money on cars. I spend it on other things that, that give me pleasure or experiences or whatnot. And so... Um, in many cases, I think parents are fearful of the comparison, but in some ways, I think you want to embrace that comparison and say, look, we're the Dwight family. We do things a little bit different, and and it's not anything to be embarrassed about. It's kind of crucial to who we are, and we're actually pretty proud about that. So I think it's, a, it's actually an excellent opportunity to have really in-depth conversations with your kids, and, um, you know, of, of course – you're hopefully modeling behavior as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, Mm -hmm. they might seem like awkward or difficult conversations at first, but over time they just become part of your, 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 your family values. So there's a great quote from Ron Lieber that I love, which is, you know, every conversation about money is a conversation about values. Mm -hmm. And I think that's so true. And that's why I really do encourage a lot of the conversations about, about money because at the crux of it, it's like, what do, what do we value as a, as a family? What gives us, a happiness or, or joy. So, um, yeah, I mean, I think if you're going 
into debt, you've just got to kind of think long term and play that out. It's like, well, if my goal is the best possible life for my kid, how good is that life going to be if I'm swimming in debt? You know, in the worst case, I could become uh, a drag on my kid's future. And, and that's certainly not aligned with, you know, where you want to be. So those are just some of my th thoughts on that. Now, I say that realizing that I've been very fortunate. Um, in my family, it was sort of a different thing where I was raised having everything I could possibly want because my father was an entrepreneur. And if, if you've ever have your uh, groceries scanned at a supermarket, you've interacted with one of my father's products, which is he was the, uh, the f founded the first company co to commercialize lasers. Hmm. Wow. Uh, which was kind of a cool thing as a kid, right? We yeah, had these absolutely. Lasers and t-shirts and stuff like that. <laughs> and I think the, 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 there's a very interesting conundrum for people, for entrepreneurs who are successful or business people who are successful or any family who's successful, which is, did you just rob your kids the opportunity to be self-made people? Hmm. Right. Like we, we worry about like, I want, you know, my kid to have everything. Is that really so great for your kid? Hmm. And so I had a lot of sort of um, guilt around money when I was growing up because, you know, my father was a self-made man. God bless him. And is a great mentor. And I wanted to have that same opportunity. Right. Hmm. And so, you know, you get a little chip on your shoulder that you need to prove yourself. Um, so I think those are interesting things to think about, whether you do have money or don't have money. Is it really so bad to, to not have a lot of money? Is that really what's giving you happiness? And if you do have a lot of money, is that really so bad? Is that something your kids should feel guilty about? What are you doing to help them, you know, be responsible with money and, and um, motivated to, to achieve on their own? Those are hard questions. Absolutely. It sounds like the, the journey itself was almost as motivating as the destination for you. So it sounds it's, and it, that's exactly what, what you're doing. Yeah, I mean, for me, what I love is the, the, the original culture of Silicon Valley is very similar, I'm going to imagine, to the conversations you had with Guy Kawasaki, mm -hmm. which is focus on building something. Yep. That's what this place was all about, like building new things, um, that solve a problem. Mm -hmm. And, and the, the money was always secondary to the real pioneers of Silicon Valley. Mm -hmm. And, uh, hopefully it, it remains that way. It comes and goes. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. It's uh, going, going through massive changes right now, even, even as we speak. Yeah. And the motivation to, to save, in my opinion, is, um, I was very fortunate in my career because I chose to, um, I realized at some point that I wasn't going to be a pro tennis player, and I found out that uh, I'd probably be better off if I focused on uh, computer science, and I realized that I loved computer science, and I ditched my uh, tennis racket early in my college tennis career, and thank goodness, because I really fell in love with writing software, and I was just in the right place at the right time. Uh, this was back in 1984, and was fortunate enough to, to kind of come in on the very early part of the boom in software and um, and benefit from that. And one of the neat things is, you know, our spending habits didn't scale with the income. And so, you know, that has allowed me to pursue things like famzoo.com, which is I don't have to rely on venture capitalists to run this company. And that's a beautiful thing because we have a mission, which is youth financial literacy. And we don't have a board of venture capitalists telling us that we should raise prices or uh, charge kids out the wazoo for losing their cards, which they do all the time. And we, <laughs> we have no fee for that. Uh, so those are things that we can, um, we can control our own destiny and our own messaging and be patient where we otherwise wouldn't if we didn't have, if we weren't self-funded. Yeah. Well, let's talk about how you brought some of those, um, I guess, uh, savings values to your kids early on, uh, when, when they were starting with this whole, um, you know, chore and reward system or partnering with you to, you know, be more savvy savers. Um, what, what were some of the, what were some of the ways that you encouraged that and, and early on in their lives? Well, I think that the key incentive was this sort of parent paid interest and in that you can put your money to work for you and that that's very powerful. And the fact that, um, like, uh, my youngest son, Basically, I've been at this for 11 years, so they've seen me at home for many, many years following my passion and doing what I'm able to do, and they repeatedly get the message that I'm able to do this because of that financial independence. 
And um, I think that the more you can sort of reinforce the message that that a money is a, a tool that can do good things, and b if you um, you know are patient and set that money aside, you'll be able to to pursue your passion to do the good things that you believe in. Um, and that's that's very powerful. So, you know, that's that in just little things like which you're already doing with your spend, save, give jar, which is money comes in and you assign it a purpose. And those purposes are not just consumption. Those purposes are sharing with other people in your community, uh, looking towards the future and building up a, a, you know, a cushion for independence and consumption. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I know that this works because uh, my youngest son was sort of, under this regimen from the beginning. He's 15. And uh, so from the very beginning, we were following the system. And he came to me one day and he said, do you mean there are some people who don't split their funds between spending, saving, and giving? (laughs) So I think if you start early, it's just second nature. Yeah, It's like, oh, that's just what people do. And so, um, you know, whether you use a system like ours that's electronic, whether you use a spreadsheet, whether you use a paper ledger Mm -hmm. or jars, at some point, the jars kind of top out because you get tired of getting dollar bills and coins. <laughs> um, but, you know, whatever system you use, I think that notion of paying yourself first, uh, you know, allocating money into functional buckets hmm. is a very simple, powerful paradigm. Absolutely. Uh, people should get used to. Yeah. So you talked about the Bank of Dad and this great interest rate that you have uh, with the right. Bank of Dad. Are you also taking advantage of any other, um, I guess, investing routes for the kids as they're growing up? Things like UTMAs or Roth IRAs. I know you and I talked about that in yeah. some comments of some past blogs. I would love to learn. Yeah, this is my yeah. absolute favorite yeah. parenting financial hack, which has nothing to do with famsu.com other than the spirit of what it's all about, which is... Um, Basically, uh, as soon as my kids get a W-2 paying job, so typically a summer job, now the dog's choking on something. <laughs> it's I'm not touching them, honestly. It's not hurting them. Uh, <laughs> but as soon as they get like a W-2 paying job, then I basically march them down to Schwab or, you know, pick your favorite place. We're in, you know, we have ones at Schwab and we have uh, uh, ShareBuilder, which I think was bought by ING Direct. Uh, Those are two places, but most places have the opportunity to set up a Roth IRA, and you would be the custodian initially. In fact, today I was just at Schwab with my 21-year-old transferring his ownership uh, from the custodial account to his. Um, But basically, a Roth IRA is terrific because basically you can – if your child makes like, let's say, a grand during a summer job, Mm -hmm. which is not atypical. You know, $1,000 maybe working in a fast food joint or whatnot, then uh, they can contribute that amount to a Roth IRA. And um, you might say, well, my son already spent all that on pizza already. You know, you might get to the end of the year and it's like, ah, you know, all the funds are gone. Well, you could gift them that sum or you could canvas all your relatives and say, hey, instead of getting some random tchotchke or whatever, how about you know you you gift this money to uh, my son Peyton in this case, and he's going to contribute to his to his Roth IRA. So, the point is, you could gift up to um, whatever the limits are, it, it, the, you know, sort of no more than what he made, and no more than the limits. And I, I think the limits are like five thousand five hundred dollars. So, yep. if if your kid's making more than that in the summer, wow. Awesome. That would, that would be unbelievable. <laughs> yeah. Your tax attorney now. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. But basically, uh, so the thing I love about this, right, is you got to work to to get the deal, mm-hmm. right? Yep. And so it encourages work. And then uh, you open a Roth, and then your next question is, well, what do we do with this money? Mm-hmm. So we got to put it to work, right? So we start talking about investing, and this is where we start talking about low cost index funds. You know, you could bet on uh, a stock like Chipotle, which um, uh, I did and I was wrong, or you could bet <laughs> on the entire stock market and buy a low cost index fund like, say, VTI mm-hmm. uh, is an ETF from Vanguard, which is the entire stock market index. And um, in fact, with my youngest son, we actually set up a competition between those two just to show like how one performed against the other, uh, because often kids... Often kids are taught to invest by investing in their favorite company, 
yep. which is actually like one of the worst investment strategies on the planet, but yes. it's the most entertaining. Mm -hmm. So try this, you know, set up a competition between the two and then they'll learn about index funds at the same time. Yeah. But in any event, in the Roth, we just, we just go index fund. So it teaches them about investing and then uh, we create a little net worth spreadsheet for each of the kids and then each quarter or each year we review that and, and talk about it. Now, the first couple of meetings are real yawners, mm -hmm. right? They're like, oh, index fund, what the heck is that? Sure. After a couple of quarters and years, and especially after the kids go off to college and start to realize how expensive life is, mm -hmm. they get super interested. And furthermore, it's been compounding now since they were 15 or 16 when they got their first job. And uh, so it's just a really great thing. And it's a tax advantage. So you're kind of getting all those things. You got to work, you learn about investing, you think long term, and, and you're getting a, a tax advantage. And if you get that habit going at, say, 16, imagine where that money's at when they're 65. Absolutely. And, and, I mean, the, fact, and the fact that they know, you said after a few meetings, they started to understand what index funds were. I don't think I understand the concept of index funds until like maybe my, until I was 30. So the fact that the fact that they would know it, understand it before they're out of the house is incredible for sure. It, yeah, it, I mean, I didn't learn about index funds until my 40s yeah. uh, or so, and um, I was lucky I finally learned about them because I was all in on, like, the companies that I worked for, you know? Exactly, exactly. And, then it, and, and any wrong thing could happen, and it goes down, and you're you're out of luck. It's better to own the 500 companies that are doing well as opposed to just the one, right? right. So, so that's my favorite uh, parenting uh, I, financial hack. And I love that, too. So did you involve There's them? There's one more thing about that, oh, by go, the way. I'm sorry ahead. to interrupt. No, go ahead. Which is the thing I love about that. Some people might be, well, well, money bags is gifting his kids money, right? Uh -huh. that's, that's kind of bogus or whatever. The way I think about it is I'd rather gift them the money now in small, relatively small increments or even aggressive increments mm -hmm. rather than them waiting around for me to kick the bucket. Right. Exactly. And furthermore, teaching lessons along the way. It seems like a really healthy way to pass money to the next generation if, if you're able to do so. And again, if you're not able to do so, you know what? A lot of relatives are very happy to make that contribution because yep. sometimes they're scratching their head saying, what do I get junior this year? And this is a great message. It's a great story. Absolutely. It helps them save for retirement or, you know, any other thing later on in life as well. You you, you mentioned that, um, you know, you've got this business, they're working with their earned income. Did you ever involve the kids in your business for that earned income or it was always, you know, yeah, cutting actually, lawns uh, or going to the fast food restaurant? If you visit famsy.com, mm -hmm. the uh, young man's face on the front, that's Peyton. <laughs> That's one of my sons. That's and great. so this year I paid him uh, for all the years that he's been modeling That's for great. Me. Oh, excellent. And, uh, so he, uh, he did pull in some moolah uh, this year because he was actually doing uh, some pro bono work for a startup. So uh, he didn't, you know, have earned income there. And, you know, he earned it. I mean, he's, uh, there's no, no, I've, that's the cheapest modeling. Absolutely. And, uh, <laughs> you know, he's a lot better looking than I am. So why not? <laughs> that's great. Well, it's actually, some... his mom, by the way, what's that? He takes after his mom. Oh, there so you go. I'm... Well, it, you made the plug for the wife already. We, we got to make sure that she gets a copy of this recording. <laughs> I have been married for, for 30 years. There you go. There's Very reason. smart. <laughs> well, cool. So we, we talked about savings a little bit. We talked about spending, talked about savings. We'd love to talk to you a little bit about giving because, you know, mm -hmm. we've got our three jars and as much as I try, and maybe it's something that I need to work on personally, my my five my five, almost six year old daughter does not get as excited about putting money in the give jar, and I'm trying to trying to make giving more fun for her. And I, I guess right. I'd, I'd like your advice on that. Yeah, I think that uh, giving can be one of the more challenging ones because it can be a little abstract, and um, y you know the the areas where we've had the most success is really aligning it with something that the kids were interested in. Mm -hmm. So. Um, Will and Taylor, my two oldest sons, were very into music. And so we got involved in a program up in San Francisco that was uh, teaching uh, the youth in the city about music. And, and we um, kind of did a whole project around funding some, um, some mobile recording units. This was maybe 10 years ago, uh, where having a Mac was a big deal. And they were recording music and recording their own songs. And, and what was neat was they had workshops and the kids were able to actually be like counselors in the workshop. So it was very hands-on. So I think that uh, that's an example of something that's hands-on, that's right up the alley, something the kids care about and it was very tangible. And, you know, they remember stories about going up there, you know, to this day. Um, one of my favorite projects we have, sometimes you can align um, – 
you know, like a, a, a charitable giving habit around a holiday. So we, for several years, we, uh, we would sit down after Thanksgiving and write uh, cards for the troops. And so it was very, you know, each kid and each family member, you know, the adults would do it too, would make a handmade card for the troops. And it was just very visceral, you know, mm -hmm. very uh, hands-on and practical. And I think it's neat when you couple it with a holiday because, you know, it just becomes a tradition, mm -hmm. right? And and so there's lots of things that families do that, that are kind of traditions. Now, the thing that I thought was cool was this year when it was with Rockstar Finance where you handed out your $100. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think that that's... That's an opportunity I think that would be really impactful to do with the kids or to also have them go into their giving jar and do the same thing. Um, that's an amazing experience, handing uh, some cash to somebody who you just bump into on the street that you you see viscerally see that they need it. Mm -hmm. it, it um, I think that's a story that would stay with a kid for a lifetime. Yeah. I, you know, I, I like that I, you're I saying for myself that. Mm -hmm. this year, you know, just um, – you know, bumped into a gentleman that I could clearly tell could use the cash and just said, Merry Christmas. It doesn't have to be complicated, mm -hmm. but it's, you know, wow, it really, it's really impactful. And so I think that's a, a an easy one to do with the kids and it's, it would be hard for them not to be touched by it. Yeah. I, I think you made a couple great points there. The, the fact of choosing charities uh, that align with things that they're personally interested in that gets them all fired up. And then the second thing you said that really got me excited is doing it with them because you're going to create some family memories that are going to last a lifetime. And I love how you do it around right. holidays too, because you know, that, that, that just makes it a little bit more exciting. And I mean, the, uh, writing letters to the troops, were you doing that around veterans day or, or some Thanksgiving uh, Thanksgiving? Okay. That's yeah. perfect. Yeah. And, uh, one site that I do like that, that, tends to resonate with a lot of kids is this Donors Choose site. Donors Have you heard choose, of Donors uh, Choose? No, Donorschoose.org. Mm -hmm. It's basically uh, teachers from around the United States post uh, projects that they'd like to fund in their mm -hmm. classroom. And so, you know, we're trying to put together a music card or whatever, and we need the funds for this. And what's nice is that kids all go to school and they all have their interests, right? So they can typically, it's like browsing, um, you know, like a Craigslist or something mm -hmm. for, for for a topic that resonates with you. So you find a teacher that's teaching some subject that you like and look at the projects. And what's neat about that is that, you know, you give the kid like a homework assignment. You're like, find a project that, you know, uh, resonates with you or whatnot, and we'll talk about it and, you know, we'll fund it with your giving jar. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing that I find is uh, if they do happen to use a site like ours with the prepaid cards, each of our kids have giving cards. And what's neat is when they hear something on the news like a disaster or whatnot, they can just go right to redcross.org, do an online donation using their card, right? And there's something about them performing the transaction that's really powerful, right? It's not like, you know, it wasn't mom or dad that, made, you know, took cash on my jar and handed it over to somebody or did it on their credit card. It was my card, my giving card. And uh, so closing the loop with the transaction, I think, is, is an important aspect. I think that's great. That's this is really getting me right here, man. Because I I, I hear the way that you've <laughs> raised your family. Up now. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I, I, I've been known to do it. Uh, no, I hear the way you've raised your family, and it's very inspiring. Because um, I'm excited about talking about finances with my kids, so that as they grow up, they're going to be fully equipped to just live the lives that they they want to have, but also to realize that, you know. Giving giving is one of the best things you can do with money, and it makes yep. you feel so good. And that's and, and, and having having an open hand instead of a closed hand in life is is just feels good, you know. Yep, so, definitely excellent. Well, you know, some people are listening right now, and they're saying this is all well and good. It sounds like you guys have some kids that really want to help out. I haven't even started asking my kids to contribute around the house. Where where would I even start? I mean, what would you say to that person? So first of all, let me disabuse you of the notion that my kids wanted to help out. <laughs> um, I think what's really interesting and, and fun now that I my kids are, most of them are in their 20s, um, you realize that uh, the good fight was worth it. In other words, you think they're not listening to you. 
you think that the fact that they don't pick up their clothes for the thousandth time is because you're a crummy parent. You couldn't convince them that work is important or to pull for the family. And then they, they grow up and they go away and you start seeing the fruits of your labor. Uh, you know, sometimes the messages are all getting through. They're just not prepared or ready or mature enough to receive them. Mm-hmm. And then when they go out in the world and learn a little bit what the world's about, you realize that all the messages are still floating around in there and they start to land. And it's really gratifying. And, um, y- you know, my kids wouldn't leap to give money or they wouldn't leap to save or any of those things necessarily. Sometimes they did, sometimes they didn't. Mm-hmm. They're normal. Well, I like to think they're normal kids. They might be abnormal, but they're, they're normal but they're good, you know, they're good kids. And, um, you know, good kids are going to act out every once in a while. I mean, being a parent is so humbling. Mm. You know, uh, I didn't realize how stupid I was until I had kids. <laughs> like, I, you know, if I saw a kid acting out, I, my, my first reaction before I was a parent was like, what's wrong with the, that kid's parents? Yeah. And then it turned out I was the the volunteer soccer coach whose kid was lying down in the middle of the field, pounding the grass, swearing at the referee. Right. Hey, coach, whose kid is that? Ah, oh, that would be mine. That'd be mine. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that particular kid, I'm not going to name any names. I got five, so I can hide amongst them. <laughs> he is one of the most thoughtful, hmm. caring uh, individuals. I'll give it away. He's a dad now. <laughs> so, um, you know, keep up the good fight and keep keep with the with the consistent messaging and even if you don't see the immediate results i bet if you're consistent with your messaging and consistent with your efforts that you'll see the long-term results and um there's no reason not to hedge your bets to do so anyway so stick with it absolutely well that makes me feel good for somebody who's in the trenches of it right now (laughs) yeah it's uh well, if we're going to inspire some people to like, uh, you know, maybe go out there and have some conversations with their kids, could you share some like age appropriate chores that you were able to provide your kids along the way to earn this money outside of, you know, going off and getting their own jobs? What, what were they doing to help around the house at certain periods of their lives? Uh, pretty much nothing. <laughs> 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 we ended up creating what we call the chore fail chart, which was we got, you know, tired of the notion of like checking off a bunch of chores for five kids. So we decided, okay, we'll do a fixed allowance, but we'll create a chore chart that when we check it off, it deducts money from their card oh, or their account. Oh, okay. All right. And so uh, that way, like the 10th time that you came down in the bathroom and their clothes were strewn all over it. You're like, okay, I'm going to go check a couple of these off. Oh, I and like that. And the neat that. thing is that uh, you can also send a text message just to rub it in. Not oh. that I'm the rub it in type of thing. <laughs> um, but, you know, as far as like age-appropriate chores, you know, I think young kids are great mm-hmm. because they actually think chores are fun. Right. You know, I, I there's this great like uh, a Pinterest uh, picture which shows like someone uh, – uh, uh, it's probably staged, but a parent like tapes a little square on the floor, gives the kid a broom and says, this is a game, you know, sweep all the stuff into the square. <laughs> you know, like, you know, little kids are like, oh, that's awesome. Or, you know, help with loading the dishwasher or whatnot. Well, when you know, did, I think when did your kids start to lose the teens. interest then? Uh, as soon as they became teens. Right? The teens. Okay. That's, yeah. that's the Got break. their own opinions. Attitudes. <laughs> but one of the coolest things I think you can do is encourage your kids to do little uh, entrepreneurial projects. Uh, so these days, man, with the internet and so forth, uh, w- one of the kids had an interest in cartooning. And so he would do these cartoons all the time. So then he used Cafe Press to create some t-shirts. And, you know, there's no built-in market better than grandparents and relatives, you know, when it comes to, uh, you know, that kind of stuff. So there's a lot, I think there's a lot of outlets. And then uh, there's actually a site called uh, nextdoor.com. Mm -hmm. which is like a neighborhoods site, which is a little kind of safer than Craigslist because they know more about you and you have to actually be in the neighborhood and stuff like that. And I've seen postings on nextdoor.com, like, you know, looking for someone to walk my dog or, Mm -hmm. you know, all that kind of stuff. I think kind of opening your kids up to the concept of side gigs Mm -hmm. is a a great idea. And, uh, you know, they're not working for mom or dad, you know it's important to work for someone who doesn't give a crap about you. Absolutely. That, that's, that's real that's life. <laughs> a very valuable experience. Uh, <laughs> and, and it's, working for mom and dad is never fun. Um, but anyway, I, I think that there's lots of opportunities to kind of get little, little uh, side gigs or whatever. I like that. So more of the entrepreneurial route instead of, instead of getting it from mom and dad. I like that yeah, a lot. Very it, cool. You know, 
kind of uh, wh whatever creative fancy they have, maybe they can, you know, think about how to turn that into a, a little business with some capital from mom and dad. Absolutely. Well, that's cool. Well, you sound like you've, you know, going building FamZoo and your and your business sounds like you had a lot of, I guess, inspiration, knowledge, excitement around trying to uh, create money smart kids. Was there any book or anything like that that was inspiring to you, or is this a lot a lot of the information you just received from your father, or I guess anything well, one that inspired of the, one you along of the, the way? To tell you the truth, one of the key places we get most of our information is from the families that use our product, mm. because we're on the phone all the time, you know, yeah. answering customer service calls. And that's one of the great things about running your own company and writing the software. You can actually fix things that people uh, complain to you about or, or, mm -hmm. or point out or broken about it. But, you know, all kinds of uh, interesting places to find uh, information. My favorite today was someone said, we actually charge our kids, if they get in an argument we, we, and they want to bring it to us for resolution, we charge them a fee for resolving it so that that they learn to resolve their own problems. It's like I'd never heard of that one before. That was the most clever one I heard. Of. But anyway, as far as uh, I, I digress, uh, my favorite book for by far is um, uh, Ron Lieber's book right up here, The Opposite of Spoiled, oh, okay. uh, on my uh, shelf here. Nice. And, uh, you know, Ron, the reason I like it is he went out and got all these sort of practical ideas talk to your kids to, um, about money and practices that you can use with them. And, you know, some things you might agree with, some you might not, but there's so many tips and tricks in there that you're bound to find something that, that resonates with you and that you can apply in your family. So I think that that's a great one. Uh, there's a book called The First National Bank of Dad, mm -hmm. uh, works for moms too, by David Owen. And that's the whole concept of running like your own bank. Mm -hmm. And, and running a simulated interest or even running a simulated stock market like I did with Quentin, our fifth child. Uh, we call him Quentin because we ran out of names. So <laughs> due to numeric-based indexing. Uh, it's a little nerd joke there, sorry. Uh, so, uh, you know, just like you can simulate um, – interest, you can also simulate a stock. So when I did like the, the Chipotle versus the um, uh, all market index mm -hmm. contest, I basically said, you bought, you know, $10 worth of stock. Mm -hmm. And we just kept a spreadsheet that tracked that value. And uh, at the end of it, when he cashes out, I'll just, you know, hand him the money. So you don't actually have to buy the securities. Sure. You can, and for them, it's all real money. They don't know really the difference. Right. Um, so that that's another book. And then if you're in the uh, Dave Ramsey uh, crowd, mm -hmm. uh, which many are, there's, uh, he, he wrote, uh, or really his, his daughter wrote a book, Rachel Cruz, uh, with him uh, called Smart Money, Smart Kids. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that's an excellent book. I think it's great. I'm not in the Dave Ramsey crowd per se, but I think some of the ideas are fantastic. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so he's got a, a, a lot of neat ideas there about matching funds with your kids and, you know, good incentive plans and things like that. That's excellent. Well, those are great resources. I'll be sure to put them in the show notes. Uh, I wanted to, um, close out and just say thank you so much for joining, but I know people are really going to be interested about checking out FamZoo. I understand they do have a, a free trial there if they wanted to give it a, give it a go. Where's the best place for people to go and learn more about that opportunity? Yeah, just go to famzoo.com, F-A-M-Z-O-O.com. And, uh, you know, uh, I, I recommend just getting the cards. It's the same price whether you get the cards or don't get the cards. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the cards, the kids really feel a sense of being grown up and ownership. And they also learn early on that digital money on a card is real money. I mean, that's, that's the thing. You know, a lot of people say, hey, you know, I, I, people spend less when they spend with cash. And, and uh, you know, I don't want my kids, you know, using this magic money on a card. Well, that's the reality they're going to be growing up on. And so the way I figured it is the sooner they get used to the fact that this is real money. Mm -hmm. And by the way, we send them a text message every time they spend. And it's kind of like, you know, that's making it more real. You have less money in your account, et cetera. The earlier they learn that that's real money, the better off they are. Mm -hmm. I mean, you don't, you don't want to really delay that process. I think you want to accelerate those mistakes when the stakes are low and get them used to uh, electronic money. So uh, I recommend getting the cards, but you can also use our original product, which is what we call IOU accounts, which is just like a ledgering system like I had in my spreadsheet. And I have a free spread spreadsheet uh, on the blog as well if, if you d don't want to uh, mess with any of that and you're into spreadsheets like I was. Excellent. Well, cool. I'll, I'll be sure to link all those in the show notes. Bill, thank you so much for taking the time with me tonight. I really appreciate chatting. And, oh, it's my uh, pleasure. It was a per very personally inspiring for me, so thank you. 
Oh, well, thank you.